All right, it is uh, 6 p.m. here, Central Time, 7 p.m., ready to start Limer Education's N-R-E-M-T Jeopardy. We are starting. So here's the plan for tonight. We're going to have fun. That's it. We're going to go through, play a Jeopardy-style game. Just a couple of things I want to say. In the chat, you have the ability to not only put in answers, but you have the ability to pick the next choice. So I'm gonna be watching the chat here. I'd love to have participation. Participation makes it fun for everyone. A couple of questions we've had so far that this is largely uh, BLS content, EMT uh, content. Um, although having recently taken the paramedic exam over myself, because I, I could, um, there's a lot of BLS that's on there. So if you're an ALS person there, we'll make it fun and there'll be material that will be good and relevant to you. Now, before introducing myself, I would like to say hi to Mr. Graham's class. It's his last day of class and you're watching Jeopardy. It is great to have you here. My name is Dan Limmer. I'm the Chief Knowledge Officer at Limmer Education. I've been an EMS a long time. EMS, police work, had the good fortune to write some books and have a big say into the uh, creative content that you see uh, in the apps from Limmer Education. So we'll tell you a little bit more about those, but this isn't about selling. This is about Jeopardy. We're going to go for that and do it now. We have five categories. We have airway. We have cardiology and resuscitation, medical and OB, trauma, and operations. Hey, wait. Aren't those the five sections we see on the National Registry? As a matter of fact, they are. So we have uh, these choices on the screen. I'm going to start with the first one. I'm just going to pick airway for 100. But please put in your choices uh, for the one that you want to go next. Use your Jeopardy strategy. And of course, put in the answer. So here we go. Patients with suspected spine injuries have their airways opened with this technique. And before we have the answer, I don't care if you say what is the, or if you just put the answers in, but let's see what happens. Let's get some answers that come into this. And I recognize there'll be a little bit of a delay here. All right, I've got a choice for the next one already. Someone's going, Andrew is going for a 400. All right, that's a good strategy. And we're getting the answers come in from, holy cow, this is great, from Alicia and Will and Andrew and Carmen and Eric saying the jaw thrust. Sometimes people say the modified jaw thrust and there's a little difference between the two, um, but really not significant. I consider them somewhat synonymous in this conversation. I will also say with each one, I'm going to give a little teaching point, not talk too much, but a little teaching point. Remember that if you can't get the jaw thrust, the American Heart Association recently said, if you can't do it and you have to go to a head tilt chin lift, do the head tilt chin lift to the minimum amount that you'll have to be able to um, open that airway, right? Protecting a spine when there's no airway has its limits. All right, so as we go, I had a request for cardiology for 400. Now, as we go, I tried to make them a little bit difficult as we went down the line. Here we go, cardiology for 400. Your AED delivered a shock. You should do this next. I need Jeopardy music here, don't I? And we'll go. I recognize there's a delay, but we had some great responses to these. And you know, some of these are simple. They get harder as they go down the line. But uh, everything here will be a good review. We're making a little point with each of these. Your AD delivered a shock. You should do this next. Amy, Roger, Will, Anthony are coming in. And this is really great that everybody is getting um, the right answer here. The right answer is compressions, all right? And it's really, there's a thing called compression fraction. And that's the percentage of time that you're doing compressions in a code. When you deliver that shock, the heart isn't just gonna, boom, go back and give you a blood pressure. You start compressions again. If they start moving their eyes or moving their hand or making noise or doing something, okay, good, then check a pulse. 
but after that AED fires, your hand should be hovered over the chest to get back in there and do compressions. Compressions, compressions, compressions. Push hard, push fast, don't stop. All right. So I don't see any other, um, any other here. So I'm gonna go and I'm going to pick one while we go. I'll keep an eye, oh, I got it there. All right, cash trauma for 300. Trauma is always a popular topic. When the brain herniates, you would expect the pulse to do this. When the brain herniates, you would expect the pulse to do this. All right, I still get more requests for trauma here. We'll do that one next. We'll get some answers to pop up for this. There is a series of things that we expect to see. We may see this in something that's called Cushing's Triad. And we're seeing a lot of answers, but I'm seeing them kind of all over the board, increase and decrease. And I have to tell you, whether it's my students or students I, I tutor, the concepts of what the pulse and the blood pressure do in shock versus when the brain herniates, increasing intracranial pressure, um, really people have a struggle with that. So I see a lot of the correct answer uh, on here. Uh, I see a lot of the right answer on here. That correct answer is the pulse is gonna drop. It's gonna decrease in bradycardia. The pulse is going to go up. So what you'll find in Cushing's triad is a decreased pulse or bradycardia, increased blood pressure, sometimes through the roof blood pressure, 240 over, and you'll also find an irregular respiratory pattern. Rather than figuring out which one it is when that breathing becomes funky with a low pulse and the blood pressure starts going up, that's the time to worry. All right, I had a request for trauma for 500. We're going for the big guns and trauma in an EMS. I'm not really surprised by that at all. Oh, another triad. Let's see if you can get this one. Different triad, but let's see if you can get it. These three components comprise Beck's triad. So we should, first you have to know what Beck's triad is about and then what those three elements of this are. All right, Andrew wants to go to operations next. People don't, listen, Andrew's an operations guy, that's good. You know, operations is a tricky part of the National Registry. These three components comprise Beck's triad. Gonna take a little extra type in too. I'll give you a second here. All right, let me give you a little hint here. Beck's triad has signs, gives you signs of cardiac tamponade. There we go, Jay. Jay's got some of those, John. All right, so cardiac tamponade, when blood gets into that pericardial sac and puts a squeeze on the heart, it certainly affects us pretty significantly. Let's get into those. We're getting a lot. Yes, for tamponade. Here we go. Let's see what those three components are so we can move. We're getting them. JVD. You see our jugular veins stick out? Hypotension and muffled heart sounds. Now let's talk a little bit about the reality of this. If I have a patient with chest trauma and I've got good lung sounds on both sides, but I've got JVD in a crashing patient, I've got to start thinking tamponade because I would normally think tension pneumo or that, but I'm going to think tamponade. But the interesting thing is probably in less than half the people that have tamponade will you find these. And I challenge you in a moving diesel truck careening down the highway safely to go to the hospital, whether we'd really realistically be able to pick out muffled heart sounds. All right, I had a request for operations. We're going through, we're doing good. Remember, 100 is the 
easier. I make it more challenging as we go on. This priority in triage is often called the walking wounded. I think you're going to get this one pretty easily. This priority in triage, I'm trying to use my best Jeopardy voice here. This priority in triage is often called walking wounded. And here we go. Roger, how's your class doing? Are they doing okay? You're typing in their answers. Oh yeah, this one's, this one's, this one's, this one is unanimous. I'm going to go on this. Somebody give me the next one while you're typing stuff in there. It is green. When you get to a multiple casualty incident, getting on the speaker, yelling out, anybody who can hear my voice and can follow my instructions can walk to and give them a landmark. Whoever gets up and walks, they become the green triage group. Now that doesn't mean that they're all green. There could be some hidden shock in there, but secondary triage is going to catch them. So green is called the walking wounded. All right, I'm glad. I'm glad, Mr. Graham, that you got that. OB, we're going to medical and OB for 200. We do have some questions in there, so let's do it. This diabetic condition presents with moist skin. Well, I see a trend here. We've got a lot of trauma requests, a lot of OB requests here. Triads are a neat way of, uh, of remembering things, Christine, but always keep it in perspective for the patient in front of you. A lot of times people don't show all three. All right, we'll go to airway after this. All right, we're seeing the answers come in. We have a lot of hypos in the hypoglycemia here couple hypers, but I've got largely hypoglycemia. Is everyone, including Roger's class, correct? Yes, hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia, altered mental status, sudden onset, and many times moist skin. Why does it have moist skin? The whys are important. To get some glucose out of the muscles, some of that stored glycogen out of the muscles, the sympathetic nervous system uses our fight or flight. So our skin might look pale, it might be sweaty, looking like it's shock. Hypoglycemia used to be called insulin shock because patients really looked like they were in shock. Sudden onset, altered mental status, moist skin in a diabetic patient should point you towards hypoglycemia. All right, we wanted to go down to 400 and medical and OB was the last request, here it comes. Here's the OB question you wanted. When the umbilical cord is the presenting part. When the umbilical cord is the presenting part, that condition is All right, first one in, Will K gets the right answer. We're coming through. <laughs> Bad day. Okay, yeah, yeah, this is not an ideal situation. That's for sure. I like that. We're saying largely prolapsed cord. Remember, there are two conditions that involve uh, the umbilical cord that we have the potential to see. And these pregnant, I consider the, the pregnancy and the complications like nook and cranny questions. It's a relatively short part of your course, but it could be a big part of the National Registry exam. And that's why these questions are in here like this. We're seeing pretty much unanimous. The answer is the prolapsed cord. The presenting part is the umbilical cord. You often see a piece or a loop of the umbilical cord there. What's the issue? 
as that baby comes down through the birth canal, that head is going to be large and it's going to cut off its own supply of oxygen as it comes down there. It's the only time that you will take gloved fingers, insert them in the vagina and lift the baby's head off that cord. You or someone will be doing that the entire trip to the hospital to keep that baby going. By elevating mom's hips, lowering her head a little bit, little gravity can help push that baby back and hopefully keep it healthy and viable until we can get into the hospital. Now, a couple people talked about nuchal cord. A nuchal cord is when the cord is wrapped around the baby's neck. We can fix that one. If the baby emerges and you see the cord around the neck, okay, we're not going to deliver anymore. We're going to stop that. We're going to get our hands, stop those shoulders from coming out. And we have a couple of choices. With the help of a dedicated and trained person or perhaps a parent, we're going to sometimes just slip the cord over the head. There might be enough. If not, we will clamp and then cut the cord between those clamps and continue the delivery. Nuchal cord, nuchal neck, we can fix that. Prolapse cord, not so much. All right. All right, I had a, we're burning through trauma here. I had a request for trauma for 400 in the trauma category. The condition where abdominal contents are found outside the body. Anyone eating dinner? This one's for you. Please picture it. If you're an EMS person, you'll get that. The condition where abdominal contents are found outside the body. Elevating the hips, just that last question, elevating the, the pelvis in that um, prolapse cord just to keep that baby back a little bit is the usual recommendation for that. Yeah, we're going. Roger's class jumped right on this. All right, Andrew, airway is next. And we're getting this. And the correct answer that keeps popping through here in the chat is an evisceration. All right, that evisceration is when abdominal contents are outside the body. Now, what we don't want to do is have those contents go back in. We often see these in stab wounds, sometimes in industrial things. Most of the time, it's a relatively small part of the bowel. When we make the pictures in your textbook, we go to the butcher, we get some nice sausage and take coffee grounds and caro syrup and um, food coloring and make them all oogie and put them on the belly of some unsuspecting person with cold, disgusting sausage and make them lay there for hours while we take pictures. In real life, it's often a relatively small piece of bowel. The treatment, keep it moist. Don't lacerate it, right? A moist, sterile dressing. We moisten things with sterile saline, not water, if it comes in contact with the body. Put a dressing over that and then we put an occlusive dressing over that. Keep it all sealed in there nice and tight. It's called an evisceration. All right. So we're going back to airway for 300. You should administer a ventilation until this happens. I tell you, there's a lot of attention being paid to ventilations now. We always, uh, always aren't, we're not always perfect in that. Excitement, sometimes boredom in a long code, isn't always our friend. You should administer a ventilation until this happens. Hannah, you don't need to put a question mark after that. You're right. All right, I'm this these answers give me hope for the future of EMS. Yeah, exactly. You're seeing that pop through there and you're putting that in. All you want to do is have the chest begin to rise. We often overventilate in both rate and quantity of air we put in. That can often cause um, some negative consequences. We're going to do a couple practice questions at the end of this session, and we'll address that in one of those. But yeah, don't overinflate. Do this until the chest begins to rise. All right, I had somebody who wanted to go in the airway category. We want to do airway for 400 since we're there. Turns out airway for 400 
is a cousin to Airway for 300. A standard adult BVM holds this much air. A standard adult BVM holds this much air. Sunshine, Scotty, Miguel are kind of in the right track here. A lot of people are saying, Christine, okay, good. I was at the MS conference chatting with the AMBU people and uh, just to confirm this, and I was shocked. A standard adult PVM. Now, this is probably the biggest discrepancy that I've seen in this evening session of Jeopardy. Now we're getting up there. Let's take a look at the correct answer. 1,500 to 1,600 mLs. Now, if you look at that, our average breath is 450 to 500 mLs, and it will take that, sometimes even a little bit less, depending on the size of the patient, tells us why we tend to overventilate a little. The adult BVMs give us three times or more than three times what we need to ventilate. Now, some systems are going to pediatric BVMs, the large child BVMs for adults, and I think that's okay. But sometimes we need, we're getting a mask seal, we're sealing things, we might need a little bit of that extra air. So I want you to be careful, but I want you to ventilate at a good rate and a reasonable depth. You don't have to slam that bag against your leg or if somebody else is holding the mask, give it a full collapse. It's too much. All right, if we have any other requests here. We have nothing. We did one in cardiology resuscitation, but it didn't change color. You could, uh, Kristen, use a peds bag. I totally agree with that. Let's go to the top for cardiology and resuscitation. Compression should be delivered at this rate. Compressions should be delivered at this rate. And I put questions like this in here. All right, got a couple requests for ops for 200, cardiology for 500. We'll go through and do those. You know, the National Registry, a significant part of it, has to do with cardiology and resuscitation. Now, at the EMT level, that's significant because they dig deep into the American Heart Association guidelines to get the material to have that many questions. It may only be one or two chapters in your EMT book, say, but it means there can be a lot of depth in those questions. Now, there is there had been a change. About every four years, they change the guidelines, although we're not always the best in following some of those. Compression should be delivered at this rate. This rate, as most people are saying, 100 to 120 per minute. The Heart Association changed that from at least 120 and gave a range because people going too fast won't allow the ventricles to fill. If we go too fast, much like if we had a patient with a very rapid tachycardia, we start to lose cardiac output because the chambers can't fill. And we don't want that same problem in CPR. 100 to 120 compressions per minute. Push hard, push fast, don't stop is the rule. All right, going back. So we had, go back and see, operations for 200, here we go. In legal terms, this means the EMT caused the harm to a patient. Remember, operations covers the front of your book and the back of your book. Let's just say all the introductory material and all the operations material. Really anything that's not in the other four sections. It's not just the driving and hazmat and MCI and incident command. It's medical legal and lifting and moving and well-being as well. 
In legal terms, this means the EMT caused the harm to a patient. All right, I'm going for a deeper term than negligence. This means the EMT actually caused the harm. There's generally looked at as four components for negligence, that the patient was injured, that the EMT had a duty to act. There was a breach of that duty. Harm was caused by error or omission, say. And then finally, the last one is the legal term that says the EMT caused the harm. If we do CPR on a patient and they die, it's not the EMT's fault. If we tip over the stretcher, it may be the EMT's fault. And what is that? Spooky, you passed the National Registry at 70. Couldn't have done it without us. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go and I'm going to tell you this word. And it is proximate cause. Proximate cause me is the reason if you do CPR and the patient dies, it's not your fault. But if you do something that directly causes injury to the patient. You do something or don't do something they need. You tip over the stretcher. You give a, a blatantly crazy medication, right? It's an act that you did that directly caused the patient's death. So this was a great question. We hit some serious nooks and crannies in this in our medical legal. Remember, duty to act, breach of the duty to act, Injury caused to the patient and proximate cause that the, that the EMS provider actually caused that injury. All right. Awesome. So we're going to, I believe we're doing cardiology for 300 next. This breathing is gasping and irregular, sometimes called dying breaths. Right? A lot of people didn't remember that term. A little nook and cranny in there. Maybe you'll see it on the registry. Maybe you won't, but that's my job. This breathing is gasping and irregular, sometimes called dying breaths. Oh, there we go. Look at that. They're flying tonight. And great answers. Now, there's some really important parts uh, of this. And I'm going to go for the answer because you're getting it's called agonal breathing. Whoever's taught you all has done really, really well. Agonal breathing are occasional breaths. They're gasping. A little bit of <clears throat> the chest just moves a little, but it's more of a heave. No air is exchanged. The Heart Association is very clear on this. Agonal breathing should be considered not breathing at all. They are dying breaths. Don't confuse this for breathing. Remember that the CAB approach is someone who's not breathing, doesn't appear to have any life in them like that. Agonal breathing should not be considered breathing when you are making a decision on whether to check the pulse and most likely be doing CPR. All right. Agonal breathing guys are awesome. Let's go to operations for 300. Hepatitis transmitted by the oral fecal route. Mmm. Hepatitis transmitted by the oral fecal route. Which one of the variations of the hepatitis virus is this? Andrew says, our instructor uses y'all's app. Your instructor has a good sense about him, Andrew. I like that. All right, we're getting a lot of good answers coming in here. When you read a restaurant menu that says undercooked food or raw foods may cause this condition, may cause illness, they are looking at, as we see coming through this list, they are looking at, most everybody is correct here, hepatitis A. Hepatitis A is the oral fecal route. Often uh, uncooked seafood, uh, raw seafood from a raw bar that may have some um, 
well, remnants from a sewage treatment or somebody who did something in the water, they probably shouldn't have done the water right near that oyster. So in that case, hepatitis A is the oral fecal route. B, C, and other things down the road for hepatitis are all bloodborne. Hepatitis A, the oral fecal route. All right, so my last one, let me look through. I had a request here. Cardiology for 500. I think we did 400. For some reason, it didn't change. Ooh. Blood settling that indicates resuscitation is futile. I think this is important. We talk a lot about how to resuscitate, but when not to resuscitate. So that's why I put this in here. Blood settling that indicates resuscitation is futile. All right, we're getting some good answers here from Sarah and Leandro. Jake County's advanced EMT class. I love AEMT. I love teaching AEMT classes. Welcome, Jay County. Yeah, that's exactly right. It starts as a modeling, M-O-T-T-L. The skin kind of models and marbles. And then eventually blood settles to the dependent areas. Generally, you'll start to see this in 20 minutes or so, but by 30 minutes, you're gonna to start to see it. After you get on there, it's gonna be more. But when that blood is settled for a period of time and that dependent lividity is obvious, a dark coloring to the skin shows that blood has settled in those dependent or low spots is one of the indications that you should not resuscitate. Now you always follow your protocols and guidelines, but the other two things that generally tell us not to resuscitate, one which was mentioned here quite a bit, is rigor mortis, is stiffening of the body after death. The other one, injuries incompatible with life. That's the person in a bike crash that's almost cut in half. Sometimes parts of the skull are missing and brain is exposed. Things that people obviously can't live from is the other thing that usually indicates not to resuscitate, but of course, follow your guidelines. All right, operations. Let's go for operations for 500. The blue field in an NFPA 704 sign represents this. The blue field in an NFPA 704 sign represents this. Now there are some people in there, look at you guys are all being nice to each other and talking about this, you know. Sometimes I look online and in different groups, people can be a little cruel. Uh, supporting each other like that is just really, really awesome and important. And thank you guys for doing that. It, it, makes me, uh, it makes me happy to do that. Now there's probably a few people out there thinking, What's an NFPA 704 sign? Anybody want to add in what the other elements are? All right, there's a few people taking a, taking a, uh, a stab at this. So as we go through, an NFP 704 sign is affixed to buildings and structures that aren't movable. NFPA is the National uh, Fire uh, Protection um, Association. And these signs have four colored diamonds on it. If you walk into a convenience store and you see the things of propane cylinders there, you will see um, one of those. All right, so this, the choices are flammability, reactivity, health hazard, and then special concerns, the blue is health hazard in the NFPA 704 sign. National Registry Exam can include images now, has a lot of things that can be in there, so we're putting up some questions just in case you happen to see those. All right, going back, we're whittling down here, we're narrowing it down really well. All right, I'm gonna go, let's, let's go back up to the top. We got some trauma left here. The transition from compensated to decompensated shock begins when this happens. The transition from compensated to decompensated shock 
begins when this happens. Somebody's compensating. There we go. All right, and we're getting again. We're, you guys, you guys know what you're doing here. And as we're largely seeing through here, and and I will say that there are some people both in the uh, brain herniation and some of the shock questions sometimes get these reversed. It's a good thing to study before the test. But in this transition from compensated to decompensated shock, it is the drop in blood pressure that makes the change. We do a lot to compensate for shock. We increase our cardiac output. We constrict our arterioles in our body. We go through and we try and do everything we can to maintain our blood pressure and perfusion, but that only goes for so long. When we can't do it any longer and our blood pressure starts to drop, that is the transition from compensated to decompensated shock. A lot of places are using the mean arterial pressure now at 60 to 65. Um, if you have a cardiac monitor, that little number off to the side, that mean arterial pressure is a new, uh, well, not a new, but a, a common thing people are also using to help define shock. All right, so let's go and start cleaning up a little things. I'm gonna go back up to medical and OB for 100. Just because we got to get these going. And remember, the 100s are easiest. This sound is frequently heard in an asthma attack. Put a grounder out there for you, hopefully. This sound is frequently heard in an asthma attack. Gabriella, let me see if we have any trauma left. We can do that next. All right, this is a relatively easy one, but we'll do a little bit of teaching with this one like we do with all of them. This sound is frequently heard in an asthma attack. The overwhelming answer that we have here is wheezing. If you got that, one of the many people did, it's a good job. One of the things that's important to remember is what are upper airway sounds and what are lower airway sounds? Well, upper airway sounds is the larynx above the larynx, and lower airway sounds are below that. Well, wheezing, crackles, fine crackles or rails might be fluid. Uh, coarse crackles or ronchi or a rattling noise means there's junk in there. Those are some of our lower airway sounds. Upper airway, strider is the big one. Upper airway obstruction, airway swelling. That's strider, that's an upper airway sound. Frequently heard in asthma attack, how to remember air can go in relatively easy in asthma, but it has trouble going out through those narrowed bronchioles. And wheezing is the sound it makes when we get there. All right, Gabrielle, we have one trauma question left. This one's for you. Tension pneumothorax causes this type of shock. Oh, I have my Jeopardy voice on again. Tension pneumothorax causes this type of shock. There are four functional descriptions of shock. Every one of the big lists of shock fall into one of four functional categories. It's most commonly how we teach it now. Obstructive, distributive, cardiogenic, and hypovolemic, low volume. Now, tension pneumothorax causes shock. We have uh, the inferior vena cava coming up, returning blood from our, from our pelvis and our belly and our lower extremities back up to the heart. But when it gets up there, it's such low pressure. And that tension pneumothorax takes and collapses a lung. It puts pressure in that chest and it can occlude that inferior vena cava and stop blood from coming back to the heart. We look at tension pneumothorax as a pulmonary thing or a hypoxia thing, but it really is all about the shock it causes. And for our ALS people here, when we try and fix that tension pneumothorax with the decompression, we're trying to restore 
uh, circulation and, and stop that shock. That's what we do. And we get the overwhelming answer here again comes in as obstructive shock. We're blocking blood flow by that blood trying to get back to the heart. We have hardly any preload. We have the, the blood coming from our head, right? The brain's a furnace, it needs constant fuel. So all that blood has to come back down through the veins in our neck, tries to get back in the chest and it can't because of that pressure, makes our jugular veins stand out. Hypotension, JVD, and absent lung sounds, that's gonna be the hallmark of a tension pneumothorax. Right, and that's it. Remember, it's a big, big circulatory and shock problem. The talk about the, the tracheal deviation, hardly ever gonna see that. Yes, it can cause that with enough pressure, but there's two reasons why it's very difficult to tell. The trachea at the suprasternal notch is relatively proximal, and it takes so much pressure to move that, you will most likely have a tension pneumothorax in that patient and won't see tracheal deviation. All right, as we go back, we have some cleanup here. You guys are doing awesome. All right, I'm gonna go, let's start cleaning up. I'm gonna do some left to right. Airway for 200 says, tidal volume times respiratory rate provides this respiratory measurement. I think pathophysiology is so important. Tidal volume times, well, physiology in this case, tidal volume times respiratory rate provides this respiratory measurement. Here we go. We're starting to get those great answers coming in. Yeah. This is minute volume. Minute volume takes our respiratory rate times the amount that we bring in with each breath. That's our tidal volume. Now remember that we have dead air space. About 150 mLs of the air we bring in just fills the tubes and never gets to alveoli. Why is this important? This gives us the, the two factors that really help us determine whether someone's in respiratory failure. Do they have the volume and do they have the rate? Okay. All right, so there's our way for 200. Let's go to cardiology and resuscitation. Three chewable aspirin contain this number of milligrams. Now I could have said two or four, but anybody could have said two or four. I want to test your math here. Three chewable aspirin contain this number of milligrams. Fifteen hundred. Holy, you're gonna give a giant ulcer. All right, we were all over it. The Leo element just kind of said, "Here's what it is." All right, Leandro, Christian, Junior, Roger, Glenn, Roger's class. I had to think about this for a second. So the three chewable aspirin, aspirin that we chew, those baby aspirin are eighty-one milligrams each. If we have three of those, 243 milligrams. That's the calculator, absolutely, there we go. All right, I got a request for medical emergencies for 500. Kussmaul's respirations are found in this diabetic condition. Kussmaul's respirations are found in this diabetic condition. After we finish, we have a couple more topics. I'm going to go over three National Registry style questions. All right, and the answers are coming in.
And we see a couple different answers here. We have a lot of people saying DKA, and some people are saying hyperglycemia. And we'll talk about which one this is. All right, I think the overwhelming number of people in the group are saying DKA or diabetic ketoacidosis. And that is in fact the correct answer. Why do we have Kussmaul's respirations, which are, by the way, rapid, deep breaths? The rapid, deep breaths are because of that acidosis. We're trying to blow off CO2. We're trying to help deal with that acid. Our respiratory rate can affect it a little. It's not going to solve the problem, but that's why we have it. You may also see Kussmaul's respirations, and I've seen this in people at overdose on aspirin. Why is that? Because aspirin is an acid. So when people are trying to deal with an acidosis, those rapid breaths are designed. That's why the correct answer here is diabetic ketoacidosis. All right, we're going through. Let's go back to airway. I think we did airway for 200 already. Let me just check on that one. Yep, we did that, didn't go away. Airway for 500, this is going to be challenging. Ooh, have to have some peds in here. A neonate should be ventilated at this rate. A neonate is defined as birth to the 30 days, that first month of life. If we need to ventilate that neonate, what should we ventilate them at, what rate? A neonate should be ventilated at this rate. And this is fair game for the National Registry. All right, now remember that a neonate is going to be different than an infant and different than a child. We've already increased the, the rates for the child and the infant up to 20 to 30. And the neonate, as many of you are saying, breathe, baby, breathe. I think we're all saying that under our breath. While we are ventilating at the rate of 40 to 60 per minute. The little ones uh, above neonate, we're going to do about 20 to 30. But that neonate, their respiratory rate is going to be really high um, at birth. So 40 to 60 is the caress. Yeah, this is a good, this is a nook and cranny. And this was also a 500, and that's why we were there. So we've already done the 400 in cardiology resuscitation. We have two left. Diplopia means this. What is diplopia? And there's a reason I put this in here. Our fast assessment for stroke, the old Cincinnati pre-hospital stroke scale, has now been changed. A lot of people are using BFAST, B-E-F-A-S-T. All right, we're getting this. Yeah, here we go. Because I want to have some time to get to those, those quick questions. Thank you so much for participating. Makes it so much fun for me having everybody jump in here. I, I'm going to just go for this because everybody did so well. Double vision. Diplopia means double vision. Why do I put terms like this up? Two reasons. One, the National Registry uses medical terms. I want you to be exposed to them. Yes, it's double vision, but the clinical term is diplopia. The second reason is in the new B fast eyes. B is balance, E is eyes. And double vision and vision problems can be part of signs and symptoms of a stroke. The BE part of BFAS deals with those large vessels in the back of our head that a lot of times we missed if we don't put BE with our FAST exam. And going back for our last Jeopardy answer, operations for 400, the equation heart rate times stroke volume equals what? Heart rate times stroke volume equals what?
Kristen said that there's a lot of terms that people that you didn't know um, that if you do get a word that you don't know on the, on the National Registry, don't freak out, right? Just don't freak out. See if you can answer it without that word or figure it out just based on the type of word that it is. Um, sometimes you can get it. If you've got a word in there you don't know, but the patient looks like they're crashing, then you have an idea to go to something that's more significant in the choice. Never give up on a National Registry question. Always try and work it out to the best of your ability. And we're getting great answers here with cardiac output or heart rate times stroke volume equals time to go to the hospital is another suggestion that we have here. Cardiac output is the correct answer. Our heart generally beats about 70 times a minute. Our stroke volume is about 70 mLs per beat, which means we put out about 4,900 mLs per minute or about five liters per minute. If our pulse drops, we may find a reduction in cardiac output. If our stroke volume drops, and remember that cardiac output is one part of the blood pressure equation. Blood pressure is cardiac output times vascular resistance, the amount of squeeze in the blood vessels. And so we put that together. All right, that gets us. We're going to come up and I'm going to, that's me. And let's put up three National Registry questions. I want to try and keep this to an hour. I've got about eight minutes. I'm going to give you a second to read this question. You can put your answer in here. Let's see how you do. An unresponsive 55-year-old female who has a history of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease, is lying in bed. Her husband tells you she has progressively been having more difficulty breathing and now he can't wake her. She's tachypneic with shallow respirations. You should first. Now this might be an example where you don't know what that disease is, that ALS, a neuromuscular disease. So in that, you don't really need to know that. Why is that? because she's having difficulty breathing, she has an altered mental status, and she has shallow respirations. As people are starting to put in here, we're going for choice D because she is in respiratory failure. Some people, a couple people, if you're looking at the non-rebreather mask, here's the keys that's gonna tell you assisting your ventilation uh, is the right answer. That word shallow. Remember, fast breathing can be inefficient. We have to get 150 mLs of air in before we even get to the alveoli. Rapid shallow breaths or respiratory failure as much as six breaths a minute are respiratory failure. So we're getting choice D in here quite a bit. That's the correct answer. Words like shallow and altered mental status are gonna be the keys to respiratory failure and getting you there. Next question. Five-year-old female is in respiratory arrest. As you begin to ventilate her with a BVM, her vital signs, pulse of 64, ooh. Respirations of 20 and are assisting with the BVM. Blood pressure is 92 over 68, satting at 88% on supplemental oxygen. All right, after five minutes, her pulse is 100. Respiration still 20, you're ventilating her. Blood pressure is now 60 systolic. Her saturation is 99%. You should suspect the change in her blood pressure is due to increased watt. Now, as you're looking through this, let me say a couple things. When you get a question like this, plan on reading it twice. Don't rush to the answer. There's a lot here. Let me break it down quickly. She's five. So a pulse of 64 is essentially bradycardic, it's bad. You're bagging her, but her blood pressure is okay. That blood pressure is fine for a five-year-old. She's hypoxic. So what do you do? You ventilate her. But after five minutes, her pulse comes up and her SAT's 99%, but her blood pressure tanked. Why is that? Because we increased her thoracic pressure. Normally I breathe in, right? My diaphragm drops, my ribs come out, it lowers the pressure in my chest and makes air rush in. Well, my diaphragm comes back up, my ribs go in, makes increased pressure and has air come out. But what that also does is it helps 
blood move through my vena cava. It's low pressure. As the pressure changes in my chest, it helps my circulation. But now I've got all positive pressure. Just positive pressure and bagging. So if it's constantly positive, if I overventilate my patient, shock is possible because of that increased thoracic pressure. If I increase my heart rate, make my blood pressure go up. If I increase my systemic resistance, my blood vessels will get smaller. That would make my blood pressure go up. Oxygen saturation isn't going to affect my blood pressure significantly to this extent. There's two ways to get a question right. Know the answer or no, three of them aren't the answer. And knowledge of physiology is what's gonna get you there. That and taking your time and reading that question well. Last question before we stop. 16 year old has a history of asthma. He called because he continues to have trouble breathing despite taking his prescribed medications. You auscultate diffuse wheezes. He tells you he used his inhaler a few times today most recently 30 minutes ago. His vital signs, pulse 112, respiratory to 24, 142 on 94, he's a little stressed, that 16 year old, sagging at 88%, we wanna fix that. You should administer oxygen and next. What do we do next? Roger, your class is still on it. All right, we're getting pretty common, pretty common answers here in doing this. And we're pretty good. See, the correct answer here is choice B. Let's give him an ebb. Let's fix that. He has wheezes. Now, don't ever go by these artificial rules. I know there's some instructors here. Be really careful when you teach your students. Don't use the words always or never. Why does this person need a neb? Don't freak out because he's used his inhaler. He's still wheezing and we have to fix it. He may not have used his inhaler properly. We don't know, but a neb is going to do that. You're, he's got a little bit of a tachycardia. Yeah, but you know what? If you fix those wheezes, he'll relax. He'll be less hypoxic and his pulse will probably come down. So in this, he doesn't need his ventilations assisted with a BVM, right? Because he's talking to you. Respiratory failure involves two things. It involves inadequate rate or depth, that respiratory problem and altered mental status. Someone doesn't come up to you and say, yeah, <coughs> I think I have a little bit of respiratory failure because their brain doesn't work with respiratory failure. The brain's a furnace, it burns oxygen constantly. If we take away that oxygen, the brain mis misfires, it malfunctions. So you don't have respiratory failure without some level of altered mental status. And he's answering questions. I'm not gonna do a BVM, right? Yeah, I might do an IV after this. I put this in here for our advanced life support people that were here, right? I do believe all the questions we did earlier in Jeopardy have to do with everybody as a PLS person or an ALS person, you'll need to know that stuff. But for you, yeah, you could start a line. Okay, fine. But get the NEB started, right? It's, it's not going to hurt. It's probably going to fix the problem. And then begin rapid transport. No, we can fix this problem as we go. All right. So. All right. Good, good, good. Great answers for this. Like I said, you guys have been awesome sticking with me. I've got one more slide, and if anybody's got a question or two while I'm putting this up here and doing my final spiel, I am happy uh, to answer that. Mr. Graham, student said it was beneficial. Good, I'm very happy for that. Um, we have a couple, uh, a couple things here. Um, we have a uh, videos, we have some videos that individuals can use, or we have for the classroom. We have our crash course video and our two hour review video. The discount code to get a discount with anything that you can get from Limer Education. Use discount code, ready for this one? Very original for this, Jeopardy. J-E-O-P-A-R-D-Y. The discount code of Jeopardy um, will do that for us. Cliff Moore is one of the good guys. All right, so that wraps up our 
our presentation here of uh, NREMT Jeopardy. I'm Dan Limmer from Limmer Education. I'm just uh, seeing if we have any other thoughts. Listen, you are all uh, welcome. Um, and I want to say thank you for taking the time to be here. I want to wish you the absolute best when you take the National Registry, whatever level that you're taking it on. And you know what else I would do is I would I would wish for you uh, the joy and the experiences I've had in EMS over all these years. Um, it's good. There's going to be people are going to complain, but it's good. And you can go out there and make it better. I'm very confident of that. And the kind words that you're sharing and the support for each other uh, warm my heart. Um, the holiday season's coming up, so from us at Limmer Education, we uh, wish you uh, the best in everything that you do. And I'll just say one more time, Jeopardy, J-E-O-P-A-R-D-Y. Uh, use that at lc-ready.com for those videos, for some apps to help you. Um, and oh, you guys are awesome. I Thanks, dude. I get it. Um, that's it. I think we covered it for, for tonight. I want to thank you all for attending. It was big fun for me. I think that there'll be another one of these in our future coming up. Take care. Be good. Go out and do good things.